All right, I have a great show for you today. I have with me today presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy, and I am very interested to hear his policy ideas for improving the United States of America. Vivek, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's good to meet you, Stephen. Good to be on. So uh, I want to actually hear from you. Uh, I think you have a bold message. I think you have a positive message. And I watch you on other news stations, and they seem to try to sabotage you, gotcha, uh, use old words against you, but then they edit them so that they can, you know, get their point across. So I I've got questions from myself. I've also got questions from my community. And uh, I appreciate you coming on today. I know just how busy you are. Thanks, man. I, I appreciate it. And I am... Uh more drawn these days to longer form discussions that uh, no doubt whatever we talk about, somebody on cable news is going to pluck and airlift some, you know, quote taken out of context in our conversation. That's been the name of the game in politics, but these longer form conversations are good. So I enjoy them. Great. Well, I'm excited to introduce you to my, my community. Uh, the first thing I want to know is how will your future administration address the soaring cost of living, including expenses like gas at the pump, groceries, and housing, when more than 50% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck because of the, the, the raging inflation? Yeah. So the reason that people are feeling economic pain, I mean, forget the Biden numbers about job growth numbers this quarter versus that quarter when most of those jobs are increases in government salaried positions, put the Biden nonsense to one side. What's actually going on? Prices have gone up. W wages have not gone up. Interest rates and mortgage rates have gone up. So people are feeling the pinch when it comes to buying a home, when it comes to buying their groceries, when it comes to filling up their gas, but their wages haven't kept up. So, so I get the frustration. How are we going to address it? Basic principle here increase the supply of fill in the blank, everything that actually matters. Let's talk about energy. Increase the supply of fill in the blank energy in the United States of America. Drill, frack, burn coal, embrace nuclear energy. Why aren't we doing it today? Because of three letter agencies in Washington, DC, the Department of Interior, the Department of Energy, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and so on, the EPA, that have been fundamentally hostile to energy production in the United States. So it's the basic laws of supply and demand. When supply goes down and demand remains constant, prices go up. That's exactly what's happened in the domain of, say, energy production. But now you can fill in the blank with almost anything. Fill in the blank with food. Well, we have a regulatory state that has in part impeded food production, both here and other parts of the world, but here in the United States increase the supply of food production. That's how you bring down the cost of food. Increase the supply of fill in the blank. Housing. Why do we have constrained housing in this country? Land use restrictions, all kinds of regulatory dictas coming from on high from the EPA that have constrained the supply of housing by constraining the ability of home builders to build. Some of those regulations are at the local level. Others are at the federal level. So it's a general old, you could call it a classical worldview, Austrian economic worldview, whatever it is. I think it's the correct view. The, the right way to deal with these supply shortages that result in price hikes is to increase the supply of everything that we produce that's worthwhile producing here in the United States of America. What's the major opposition to doing it? The regulatory state, largely unconstitutional regulations coming from on high. How can I address that as US president I'll rescind the unconstitutional regulations. That sounds like I'm being facile. Is that, is that a thing a president can do? The answer is absolutely. And we're in a particular window right now where a president is empowered in no uncertain terms to do it. Probably the most important Supreme Court case of our lifetime was West Virginia versus EPA that came out last year. That held that certain regulations that bind the coal industry in this country imposed by the EPA, those were unconstitutional, the Supreme Court held, because Congress never gave that agency the explicit power to write those regulations. Think about that. That's interesting. If those regulations from the EPA were unconstitutional, 
then that means most of the federal regulations are unconstitutional because Congress never gave those three-letter agencies the power to enact those regulations, which in turn have the effect of constricting the supply of things that matter, food, energy, housing, and so on. So can I fix that as U.S. president? The answer is yes. It just takes a president with a combination of the knowledge of why they're doing what the heck they're doing, not some super PAC puppet reciting slogans handed to them by a binder, but somebody who has a deep understanding of how. Somebody who comes in, I think, as an outsider, somebody who's been a CEO, who knows that if somebody works for you and you can't fire them, that means they don't work for you. Well, you got to be willing to fire people, shut down agencies, rescind unconstitutional regulations in the executive branch, which I can do without asking Congress for permission or for forgiveness. And that's how I'm going to lead. And so the answer is yes, I can address it as president, but it's going to take somebody coming from the outside to do it. Right. Well, and I, I believe you have uh, the business experience that many politicians don't have. You know, I get tired of Bernie Sanders pushing policy down my throat when the guys literally never run a business. He has no yeah. idea what it takes to produce soap, uh, package that, market it, put it out there, build a YouTube channel, uh, build a hospital, whatever it is. You have to work within certain price parameters. You have to be willing to fire people and you have to make it easy to do business. And so I appreciate you uh, answering that question. Uh, the next one that I want to know is uh, how can your administration ensure that taxpayer money is spent effectively to protect America, support those in need and honor commitments to social security recipients rather than allocating it to Ukraine and individuals who are illegally crossing into our country on the southern border. So there's two sources of gross waste in expenditure. Let me start domestically and then I'll grow, go abroad. Domestically, we have federal budgets that are effectively written by the shadow government in the deep state, the administrative state, those three letter agencies that I was talking about. Here's how we address that problem. Start with zero based budgeting. What does that mean? It doesn't mean that you start with last year's budget and then ask, hey, what are some small cuts I can make? No, start with zero as the baseline and then build up and ask what's actually necessary. That's how many great businesses are run. That's how I've run businesses that I've built. I think it takes a CEO in the White House to build budgets and allocate money accordingly, domestically. I'd now take that same principle and apply it to say foreign aid. Most of our foreign aid w flows through corrupt institutions abroad. But again, we just start with last year's money and say, hey, we're gonna roll that number forward. Forget about that. Start with zero as the baseline. And then if we're gonna give foreign aid, we should ask the question of how that foreign aid advances US interests. Take the foreign aid that flow into Central America. Forget about it if those Central American countries aren't doing what they're doing to close the Darien Pass, that jungle in Central America, that people from Venezuela and other countries in South America are now going with caravans of migrants through, ending up crossing our own southern border, which I've seen with my own eyes. No, our foreign aid should go towards aiding the United States and our interests, even if that's in a foreign territory. That's how we have to start with zero as the baseline and then ask what's actually necessary to advance American interests. And if we're applying that prison, then there's no chance we'd be engaged in a place like Ukraine that does not advance U.S. interests. I mean, this is a war where we've spent upwards of $200 billion of direct and indirect U.S. resources to advance a war that does not in any way improve American interests. And to the contrary, is marching us closer to World War III, bring us closer to the doorstep of major conflict with Russia at the first time we've had a nuclear non-proliferation agreement with Russia since 1972. We don't have one today. It's the first time since then that we don't. This is downright dangerous financially and non-financially. So my view is now we, let's talk about abroad and the war question. We have fought wars from Iraq to Afghanistan, spending six and a half trillion dollars just on those two wars. Think about our $33 trillion national deficit we could knock down over 20% of that right now had we not fought in places like Iraq and Afghanistan, no win wars that did not advance the American interest. Now, I worry right now we're in a moment where we're marching towards potentially catastrophic or even more catastrophic wars that will not only waste a lot taxpayer resources, but cost us lives and risk our security here in the homeland. 
How do we get there? Largely falls at the feet of actually the Republican Party, neocons in the Republican Party that are bloodthirsty, many of whom make money off of war. There's Republican presidential candidates in this race who have made millions of dollars after their short-lived time at places like the UN by creating military contractors that make good money, joining the boards of companies like Boeing. It is immoral, it is wrong, it is corrupt, but it's also costing us both in terms of money and in terms of American lives. That ends on my watch, and this isn't a Democrat versus Republican point. This is as much, if not greater, a problem within the neocon ranks of the Republican Party as it is within the bipartisan establishment that really pervades both parties. So that's my view on it. Yeah, no, I, and I appreciate you saying that because as I look through my YouTube comments, I, I see all the time people saying, hey, why is so much money going to Ukraine when we can't even take care of the people in Hawaii? Or we can't yep. even take care of the people in Palestine, Ohio, where yep. we're shipping money to Palestine in the Middle East. Why am I putting up my hard earned tax dollars to just have it go to everybody but Americans? I, I think most people would be okay with their taxes if they felt that they were spent wisely. So knowing that uh, you have interest in looking through the actual budgets and saying, where do we actually allocate money, I think is a big deal to the American people. I, I think yeah. most people know you, you have to pay taxes to live in a safe and clean country, but when they see it abused and they see it sent overseas in the trillions of dollars, people, people start to worry, people start to wonder. Mm -hmm. That's right, and I think that a lot of this starts with corruption right here in the United States, special interests lobbying for it. I mean, Ukraine has an excellent lobby. Azerbaijan has an excellent lobby in the United States. That's why certain interests like Ukraine and Azerbaijan get better represented than other interests in the United States. But that's a deeper discussion we can have. I think the political system is badly corrupt. Super PACs have been a cancer on American politics, rooting for the kind of spending that hasn't advanced American interests, but does advance those special interests. And so one of the things I've learned in this is that every politician, you know, doesn't have any exception, political party or anything else. Every politician dances to the tune of their biggest donor. And in my case, that biggest donor happens to be me. But the fact of the matter is everybody else in this race is a puppet of a bunch of super PACs that are even taking off in good people, but tainting them by this broken system that we're going to have to break. And it, it is going to take someone like me coming from the outside, coming from a different generation who's lived the American dream to do it is do I love a system in which it takes somebody who has frankly achieved immense wealth in the United States to be the only one that can break that system? No. By the time I'm done with it, everybody can compete evenly. But right now, it's going to take somebody in my position to break it. Yeah. It's refreshing to hear you say that because most of us have our eyes open. We, we know that these people are, are basically handcuffed to their biggest donor, and yet they use and abuse us when it's time to get votes. Uh, but when it comes to actually making policy decision, it's what it's whatever the big donor wants. Um, of course. But yeah, I appreciate you saying that. One of one of the biggest concerns within my YouTube community, and you know, I'm at 1.4 million people, and over 40,000 people told me in a poll that I ran that their biggest concern is the southern border crisis. So, what would you do to secure the southern border? particularly with drug control and managing the impact of undocumented migrants uh, eating into the safety net programs that were funded by Americans for Americans. So I'm going to give you a CEO's perspective on this, okay? Put yourself in the shoes of those illegal migrants. They're responding to incentives. So actually put yourself in their shoes. What is the cost of coming here? What is the probability of being able to cross that border? And then what is the upside of coming here? That's the math effectively they're informally doing in their head to say, is it worth coming or not? Well, right now, what have we done? The costs are low, the probability of crossing is high and the upside is huge. We have to reverse that equation, increase the costs, reduce the probability of crossing and reduce the upside of being here. How do we do that one step at a time? First, increase the costs of coming, as I said, we're not giving another dime of foreign aid to any of those Central American countries until they have erected barriers that stop people from passing completely porously to our own southern border. They have to deal with their fair share. That increases the cost. Think about the probability of being able to cross the border. 
I went to Eagle Pass, Texas last week and actually visited our northern border, which is a story for another day, but totally open the week before. But in Eagle Pass, I just, I've never seen in my life, Stephen, a larger scale, organized, government-sponsored violation of the law, just at large scale, than I saw in Eagle Pass last weekend. What I will do in my administration, and I will be able to do this without asking anybody for permission or for forgiveness, is we will send our own military to seal that southern border. We can use it to protect somebody else's border. Absolutely, we can use it to protect our own border. There's aquatic barriers. They're cheap. They're mobile. They can move to different parts of the Rio Grande. We're not using them today. The state of Texas is using them, but the federal government's not using them. Why? Partly because Biden effectively wants this influx of illegal migrants. So basic barriers, basic militarization of the southern border, that's how you stop the crossing. Then we have to reduce the upside of being here. No more taxpayer money to fund sanctuary cities. End the opportunities that we give people here when they come here illegally. Legal immigration is different, but for illegal immigration, they should have no opportunity in this country. End birthright citizenship for the kids of illegal migrants. Read the 14th Amendment carefully. The 14th Amendment does not guarantee birthright citizenship to the kid of an illegal immigrant to this country. It says, and subject to the laws and jurisdiction thereof. Read that very carefully. So, it does take a president who's not just reciting slogans, but understands each element of that deeply. I personally think it's going to take a CEO in the White House to be able to understand each prong of that. But that's the border policy that I bring to the table. And I'm confident that if I'm taking office in January of 2025, by the end of March 2025, we will have this problem solved and behind us at the southern border. And then the frontier is going to be the northern border. It's like a water balloon, a hydraulic pump. You squeeze it in one place. The problem shows up in another. And so we also have to skate to where the puck is going. I'm the only candidate for whatever reason that's actually talking about the northern border. I've been there. I've seen it myself. And I think that we got to open our eyes to the fact that there have been 10 times more border crossings in the north this year than there have been in the average year for the last 10 years in the north of illegal apprehensions. But that's going to be where this problem then surfaces itself. And I'm prepared to handle that one, too. Gotcha. OK. Yeah, I mean, sadly, uh... More people are crossing the southern border every day than are going to Biden administration, uh, you know, fundraisers. Uh, yep. I mean, it, it's been I see what you're saying where it's like, OK, what's the carrot that's being dangled to bring them in? And it looks great. The American dream, right? Oh, I get yep. a check. I get a check for more money than people on Social Security. I totally. get a free phone. I get I get put up in a, a posh hotel in New York City. Like, wow, this sounds really, really great. Free yeah. meals. Uh, uh, they provide me with a lawyer. Uh, my my date to prove that I deserve to be here is ten years from now, and I I can show up or not show up. I mean, th these are the things that the American people are aware of, and yet the Biden administration purposely turns a blind eye to this and, and purposely is the word. Yeah. They, you they know, pretend I, that they're not, they, that this, this isn't really happening on a daily basis. And I'll say, say a couple things in response to that. When I was in the Southern border, one of the, one of the people I talked to who crossed illegally was a 12 year old girl who just crossed with her father. Now her father went into shock because of the cold in crossing the river. He went to hospital. She's sitting under a bridge, 12 year old girl. Ask her, you know, in Spanish via translation, why did you come here? And she says, well, to pursue a better life. In some sense, I don't blame her or her father. I blame the administration that's giving them a wink and a nod to come here. And I don't think anybody's better off for that situation, that particular instance in the name of compassion. This is a form of uniform cruelty in the United States. The other thing I'll tell you, Stephen, is that I've been to some non-traditional places in this campaign in a GOP primary. It's not exactly uh, par for course to go, for example, to the south side of Chicago nearly all black, all Democrat area of town that traditional Republican candidates, even Democrats, don't really show up. One of the things I found there is, there were, we had our share of disagreements, for sure. But one of the areas of profound agreement was sealing the southern border and using our military to do it. And what was interesting was that many of the people in that room, they were upset about South Shore High School, the high school in the south side of Chicago that was being converted into an encampment for illegal migrants, the cost was about to be $7,000 per migrant per month. A lot of people in that community are rightly asking, what the heck about me? I'm an American who lives here now. 
So this doesn't have to be a Republican versus Democrat issue. I don't think the America First movement is limited to one party. I think we can build a multi-ethnic working class coalition that leaves really no city left behind, no state left behind. These are fundamentally American issues. But it does take a leader who's willing to look beyond the partisan you know, blinders to seize that opportunity. And the border is definitely one of those issues. Yeah. Well, I, I don't think... Uh... Many of these sanctuary cities understood what it meant to be a sanctuary city until people started showing up. It's kind of like forgiveness is a totally. great quality until you have someone to forgive that really wronged you. And now they're they're going, wait a minute, what what do we do with all these people? How do we feed them? Uh, they they didn't contribute. They're 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 eating into all of these other safety net programs. Look at New York City. Yeah, yeah, exactly. New York City is a perfect example. Perfect example. And now they're saying. Don't come. Don't come. We, we, we can't we can't do this anymore. Right. And yep. then they're trying to blame Texas and Texas is like, wow, you get you get a small percentage taste of what we're dealing with. And you guys are buckling under the pressure. Totally. It's, it's incredible. OK. Um, you know, sadly, we have seen crime on the rise over the past couple of years. I know it varies uh, depending county to county and attorney general to attorney general, but what can what can be done on the federal level to make America feel safe again? So let's just sort of get first principles in the combination of federal and local. We know how to address the wave of violent crime in this country. We know how to do it. It's not a technical challenge. More cops on the streets, able to do their job without fear of looking over their shoulder for fear of being sued. Element A and element B is we know that many of these criminals suffer from mental health illness and psychiatric disease. Bring back psychiatric institutions in this country to involuntarily commit those who actually pose a violent danger to their community. Not to take them to mental health institutions and pump them up with pharmaceuticals. Use faith-based approaches. There are other approaches that we can use to really isolate those who pose a true danger to their community. So we know how to do this. The question is, do we have the political will to actually see it through? So it's not a technical challenge. It's a normative challenge. It's a challenge of internal fortitude. See, these are, I mean, the idea of bringing back mental health institutions or involuntary commitments. That's a taboo topic. You're not supposed to bring that up because of abuses in this country. We don't have to repeat those same mistakes. There's a better way forward. But it's going to take fortitude. It's going to take somebody who has a spine to speak the actual hard truth We've done it before in this country, in cities across the country in the 90s. I think we'll do it again. I will not send federal funding to cities across this country that are systematically failing to enforce their own local laws or promoting the violation of the rule of law in the case of sanctuary cities or otherwise. But that's going to take a leader with a spine, and it's going to create a revival of the culture of the rule of law in this country, and that's why we've abandoned it. And I think part of what's going on, Stephen, is, I mean, just think about it as, you know, if you're a parent or whatever, how can you look your kids in the eye and tell them you have to follow the law and you have to follow the rules if the government isn't following its own rules. And so what does that do when the government stops following its own rules? Even if you think about corruption at the highest levels of government, the FBI and otherwise, that trickles down and creates a culture of lawlessness in the United States. And I think that's a big part of what we're suffering today. Well, trickle down lawlessness. Uh, that, that's a great way to put it. Um, you know, uh, a majority of Americans have a desire for term limits in Congress. Uh, however, the very people that we want to limit yeah. are the ones that hold the ability to create whether there's term limits or not. Is there anything that a president can do, uh, whether trying to push their party in a direction of understanding, hey, we see that you guys go to Washington, D.C., and you come back richer, and uh, more corrupt. How do we root out some of that corruption by not allowing people to be in Washington, D.C. their entire career? So there's the area where a president can make a difference and then the area where I have a wish, but I'm not gonna make a promise on it. The, the area that everybody likes to talk about is term limits for Congress and for senators. I favor it. Of course, it's a great idea. Part of the problem is it requires a constitutional amendment to enact, and as you said, the very people who are served by the absence of those term limits aren't going to be the ones readily voting for it. And it's a bipartisan problem. It's not just about leading your party. These people in the Republican Party are often every bit as corrupt 
as many in the Democratic Party. However, there is room on what the U.S. president can do, and it could be even more impactful than the term limits in Congress. The real problem in D.C. today is that the people who we elect to run the government, they're not even the ones who actually run the government. It's the managerial class, the administrative state, the bureaucrats in those three-letter government agencies. And they're in the executive branch. Well, guess what? As your next president, if you all put me there, I will be the leader of the executive branch of the government. So the kind of term limit I will impose as a general hiring policy in the executive branch is one that, yes, I can implement on my own without asking anybody for permission or for forgiveness, let alone a constitutional amendment because I'll run the executive branch, is an eight-year term limit for anybody who's reporting into me in the executive branch in government, the millions upon millions of federal bureaucrats that are actually exercising a lot of that rulemaking and effectively lawmaking power today. So if I'm your next president and I can't work for you and collect a paycheck from you all, the taxpayers, for more than eight years, which I think is a good thing, then neither should or will any of those federal bureaucrats reporting into me either. That's something that I can do that, yes, that's realistic. I can get that done as president without relying on Congress. But that also gets to the actual cancer in D.C. today, which as broken as Congress is, it's the deep state that poses the even bigger threat. And that's what I'm planning to address. OK, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, we, the people, have the responsibility and the power to root out individuals that don't align with our values. But we can't we can't fire the ones that are dug in deep, the deep state. Right. But you would have the ability uh, to do that. Yeah. So I appreciate you uh, you sharing that. Um, I know we're running out of time. So yeah, just, we are. Just two two quick questions, maybe like a lightning thing. Sure. Um, Jeff Hayes from Jeff Jeff Hayes Films has asked me, uh, what do you? How does you? How do you and your family deal with the mainstream media apparatus as they misrepresent you on a regular basis? It's challenging, to be honest with you. It's very frustrating. That was at least my initial emotion through this. And what they do is, look, you and I are having conversation as two human beings in a long form setting like this. The mainstream media is built on 30 second sound bites. So eventually this is the future of media, but unfortunately they still, the legacy media still has a lot of power. So what they will do is take something, and I'm sure it'll be something that we said in this interview even, it happens every time. They'll airlift it completely out of the context that two human beings were actually discussing it, recast it in their own context, and then really dupe people who unfortunately I mean, people, people unfortunately consume what they're fed, you know, fall for that trick. The real answer is, I think we just ignore it. I mean, I think that one approach is to say we won't talk to the mainstream media, but I don't want to do that. If I'm running for U.S. president, I better be willing to talk to everybody. But my view is I'm going to do my job. We're going to speak the truth. I'm going to let you know who I am, what we stand for, and be unvarnished about it. And it's a bet that I'm making on the voters of this country to say that they've been lied to enough that I'm hopeful they now have been trained with skepticism to what they're force fed and can form an independent judgment. So that's my hope. That's, that's the expectation we have. My heart says actually that's where most, certainly in our own conservative base really are. That's a good thing, but that's certainly the bet we're making because if people are gonna buy up what they're force fed by the mainstream media and by the super PAC puppet masters who are stuffing your mailbox with you know, artificial mail that, that gives you a bunch of falsehoods, yeah, there's really no chance for an outsider like me to do it. But my bet is people are trained to know that they can see through that veneer and get to truth themselves. Great. Thank you very much for coming on. I know how busy you are. I want to be respectful of your time. I also uh, want to wish you luck on the rest of your journey with uh, becoming president of the United States of America. Vivek Ramaswamy, thank you so much. I will put links down below so that people can learn more about your campaign. But have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Stephen. Good to meet you, man.